This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragedy of King Lear by William Shakespeare Recorded by LibriVox volunteers to mark the 400th anniversary of the first performance of the play, which was on December the 26th, 1606. Act One, Scene One, A Room of State in King Lear's Palace. Enter Kent, Gloucester, and Edmund. Kent. I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. Gloucester. It did always seem so to us, but now, in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most, for equalities are so weighed that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is not this your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I am brazed to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could, whereupon she grew round-wombed, and had, indeed, sir, a son for her cradle, ere she had a husband for her bed. Do you smell a fault? I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have, sir, a son by order of law, some year elder than this, who yet is no dearer in my account, though this knave came something saucily into the world before he was sent for, Yet was his mother fair, there was good sport at his making, and the whore son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent, remember him hereafter as my honourable friend. My services to your lordship. <laughs> I must love you and sue to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He hath been out nine years, and away he shall again. The king is coming. Sound a senate. Enter one bearing a coronet. Enter King Lear, Cornwall, Albany, Goneril, Regan, Cordelia, and attendants. Lear. Attend the lords of France and Burgundy, Gloucester. I shall, my liege. Exeunt Gloucester and Edmund. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburdened, crawl toward death. Our son of Cornwall, and you are no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers, that future strife may be prevented now. The princes, France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you, shall we say, doth love us most, that we our largest bounty may extend? where nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than words can wield the matter, dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty, beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, no less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honour, as much as child e'er loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, beyond all manner of so much, I love you. Cordelia. What shall Cordelia speak? Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich, with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee lady, to thine and Albany's issue be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife to Cornwall? Speak. Sir, I am made of the self-same metal that my sister is, and prize me at her worth. 
In my true heart I find she names me very deed of love. Only she comes too short, that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses, and find I am alone felicitate in your dear highness's love. Then poor Cordelia, and yet not so, since I am sure my love's more richer than my tongue. To thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom, no less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Now our joy, although the last, not least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sister's? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing can come of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond. No more, no less. How? How, Cordelia? Mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. Good my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as are right fit, obey you, love you, and most honour you. Why have my sisters husbands, if they say they love you all? Haply when I shall wed, that lord, whose hand must take my plight, shall carry half my love with him half my care and duty. Sure I shall never marry like my sisters, to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? Ay, good my lord. So young, and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs, from whom we do exist and cease to be. Here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity, and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me hold thee for this for ever, the barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbour, pitied and relieved, as thou, my sometime daughter, Good my leash. Peace, Kent, come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most, and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. To Cordelia. Hence, and avoid my sight. So be my grave my peace, as here I give her father's heart from her. Call France, who stirs? Call Burgundy, Cornwall, and Albany. With my two daughters' dowers digest this third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly in my power, pre-eminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty, ourself by monthly course, with reservation of an hundred knights, by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due turns. Only we still retain the name and all the additions to a king, the sway, revenue, execution of the rest. Beloved sons, be yours." which to confirm this coronet part betwixt you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honoured as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron thought on in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn. Make from the shaft. Let it fall rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be Kent unmannerly, when Lear is mad. What wouldst thou do, old man? Think'st thou that duty shall have dread to speak, When power to flattery bows? To plainness honours bound, When majesty falls to folly. Reverse thy state, and in thy best consideration Check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment. Thy youngest daughter does not love thee least. Nor are those empty-hearted Whose low sound reverbs no hollowness. Kent, on thy life, no more. 
My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety being the motive. Out of my sight! See better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now by Apollo! Now by Apollo, king, thou swear'st thy gods in vain. O oh, vassal, miscreant! He makes to strike him. Dear sir, forbear. Do, kill thy physician, and the fee bestow upon the foul disease. Revoke thy gift, or, whilst I can vent clamour for my throat, I'll tell thee thou dost evil. Hear me, recreant, on thine allegiance hear me. Since thou hast sought to make us break our vow, which we durst never yet, and with strained pride to come between our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can bear, our potency made good, take thy reward. Five days do we allot thee for provision to shield thee from diseases of the world, and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If, on the tenth day following, thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, the moment is thy death. Away by Jupiter! This shall not be revoked. Fare thee well, king. Sith, thus thou will appear. Freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. To Cordelia. The gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid, that justly thinkst, and hast most rightly said. To Goneril and Regan. And your large speeches... May your deeds approve, that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus, Kent, O oh princes, bid you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. Exit. Flourish. Enter Gloucester with France and Burgundy and attendants. Here's France and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address towards you, who with this king hath rivalled for our daughter. What in the least will you require in present dower with her, nor cease your quest of love? Most royal majesty, I crave no more than hath your highness offered, nor will you tender less. Right noble Burgundy, when she was dear to us we did hold her so, but now her price is fallen. Sir, there she stands." If aught within that little seeming substance, or all of it, with our displeasure pierced, and nothing more may fitly like your grace, she's there, and she is yours. I know no answer. Will you, with those infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and strangered with our oath, take her, or leave her? Pardon me, royal sir. Election makes not up on such conditions. Then leave her, sir, for, by the power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. To France. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wretch whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge her. This is most strange, that she who even but now was your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, most best, most dearest, should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favour. Sure her offence must be of such a natural degree that monsters it, or your forvouched affection fallen into taint, which to believe of her, must be a faith that reason without miracle should never plant in me. Yet I beseech your majesty, if for I want that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not. Since what I well intend, I'll do it before I speak, that you make known it is no vicious blot, murder, or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonoured step, that hath deprived me of your grace and favour. But even for want of that which I am richer, a still soliciting eye, and such a tongue as I am glad I have not, though not to have it hath lost me in your liking. 
"'Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better.' "'Is it but this? "'A tardiness in nature which often leaves the history and spoke that it intends to do? "'My lord of Burgundy, what say you to the lady? "'Love's not love when it is mingled with regards that stands aloof from the entire point. "'Will you have her? "'She is herself a dowry.' "'Royal king, give but that portion which yourself proposed, "'and here I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy.' "'Nothing. I have sworn. I am firm.' "'To Cordelia. "'I am sorry, then, you have so lost a father that you must lose a husband.' "'Peace be with Burgundy. "'Since that respects of fortune are his love, I shall not be his wife.' "'Fair is Cordelia.' that art most rich being poor, most choice forsaken, and most love despised. Thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Gods, gods, tis strange that from their coldest neglect my love should kindle to inflamed respect. Thy dowerless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours, and our fair France. Not all the dukes of waterish Burgundy can buy this unprized precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind. Thou losest here a better where to find. Thou hast her, France. Let her be thine, for we have no such daughter, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, without our grace, our love, our benison. Come, noble Burgundy. Flourish. Exeunt Lear, Burgundy, Cornwall, Albany, Gloucester, and attendants. Bid farewell to your sisters. The jewels of our father, with washed eyes, Cordelia leaves you. I know what you are, and like a sister, am most loath to call your faults as they are named. Love well our father. To your professed bosoms I commit him. But yet... Alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So farewell to you both. Prescribe not us thou duties. Let your study be to content your lord, who hath received you at fortune's alms. You have obedience scanted, and well are worth the want that you have wanted. Time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides. Who covers faults, at last shame them derides. Well may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Exeunt France and Cordelia. Sister, it is not little I have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence to-night. That's most certain, and with you next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is. The observation we have made of it hath not been little. He always loved our sister most and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. "'Tis the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. "'The best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then must we look to receive from his age not alone the imperfections of long engraft condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them. Such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as this of Kent's banishment. There is further compliment of leave-taking between France and him. Pray you, let us hit together. If our father carry authority with such dispositions as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall further think of it. We must do something, and in the heat. Exeunt. Scene two. A hall in the Earl of Gloucester's castle. Enter Edmund with a letter. Thou, nature, art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom, and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me, for that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother? Why, bastard, 
Wherefore base, when my dimensions are as well compact, my mind is generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue? Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base? Base? Who, in the lusty stealth of nature, take more composition and fierce quality than doth with a dull, stale, tired bed, go to the creating of a whole tribe of fops got tween asleep and wake? Well, then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate fine word. Legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now, gods, stand up for bastards, Enter Gloucester. Kent banished thus, and France in choler parted, and the king gone to-night, subscribed his power, confined to exhibition, all this done upon the gad. Edmund, how now, what news? So please, your lordship, none. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No? What needed, then, that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all o'er read, and for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your o'erlooking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend, either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope, for my brother's justification, he wrote this, but as an essay or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny, who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. Come to me, that of this I may speak more. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue for ever, and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. Hum! Conspiracy! Sleep till I waked him? You should enjoy half his revenue? My son, Edgar! Had he a hand to write this? A heart and brain to breed it in? When came this to you? Who brought it? It was not brought me. My lord, there's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's? If the matter were good, my lord, I durst swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord. But I hope his heart is not in the contents. Hath he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that sons at perfect age and fathers declined, the father should be as ward to the son, and the son manage his revenue. O oh, villain! Villain! His very opinion in the letter! Abhorred villain! Unnatural, detested, brutish villain, worse than brutish. Go, sirrah, seek him. I'll apprehend him. Abominable villain, where is he? I do not well know, my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother, 
till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you should run a certain course, where, if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it would make a great gap in your own honour, and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my life for him that he hath writ this to feel my affection to your honour, and to no other pretence of danger. Think you so? If your honour judge it meet, I would place you where you shall hear us confer of this, and by an auricular assurance have your satisfaction, and that without any further delay than this very evening. He cannot be such a monster. Nor it is not, sure to his father, that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Heaven and earth, Edmund, seek him out. Wind me into him, I pray you. Frame the business after your own wisdom. I would unstate myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means, and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies. In countries, discord. In palaces, treason and the bond cracked twixt son and father. This villain of mine comes under the prediction, there's son against father, the king falls from bias of nature, there's father against child. We have seen the best of our time, machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. And the noble and true-hearted Kent banished. His offence, honesty. Tis strange. Exit. This is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often to the surfeit of our own behaviour, we make guilty our own disasters, the sun, the moon, and the stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and traitors by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on an admirable evasion of whoremaster men, to lay his goatish disposition to the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows I am rough and lecherous, tut. I should have been that I am had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Enter Edgar. Pat, he comes, like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy, with a sigh like Tom or Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions. Fasola me... How now, Brother Edmund? What serious contemplation are you in? I am thinking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day. What should follow these eclipses? Do you busy yourself with that? I promise you the effects he writes of succeed unhappily, as of unnaturalist between the child and the parent, death, dearth, dissolutions of ancient amities, Divisions in state, menaces and maledictions against king and nobles, needless diffidences, banishment of friends, dissipation of cohorts, nuptial breaches, and I know not what. How long have you been a secretary astronomical? Come, come. When saw you my father last? The night gone by. Spoke you with him? Aye, two hours together. 
parted you in good terms, found you no displeasure in him by word or countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him, and at my entreaty forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of a displeasure, which at this instance so rageth in him that with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower, and, as I say, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak. Pray you go. There's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man if there be any good meaning toward you. I have told you what I have seen and heard, but faintly. Nothing like the image and horror of it. Pray you away. Shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in this business. Exit Edgar. <laughs> Credulous father, and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy, I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit. All with me's meat that I can fashion fit. Exit. Scene three. A room in the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Goneril and Oswald, her steward. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool? Ay, madam. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or another that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous, and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it I'll answer. He's coming, madam. I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. If he distaste it, let him to our sister, whose mind and mine I know in that are one, not to be overruled. Idle old man that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away. Now by my life old fools are babes again, and must be used with checks as flatteries, when they are seen abused. Remember what I have said. Very well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it, no matter, advise your fellows so. I would breed from hence occasions, and I shall, that I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. Exeunt. Scene 4. A hall in Albany's palace. Enter Kent in disguise. If, but as well I other accents borrow, that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I raised my likeness. Now, banished Kent, if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned, so may it come, thy master, whom thou lovest, shall find thee full of labours. Horns within. Enter Lear and Knights. Let me not stay a jot for dinner. Go, get it ready. Exit first, Knight. How now? What art thou? A man, sir. What dost thou profess? What wouldst thou with us? I do profess to be no less than I seem, to serve him truly that will put me in trust, to love him that is honest, to converse with him, that is wise and says little, to fear judgment, to fight when I cannot choose, and to eat no fish. What art thou? A very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king. If thou beest as poor for a subject as he's for a king, thou art poor enough. What wouldst thou? Service. Who wouldst thou serve? You. Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir, but you have that and your countenance which I would fain call master. 
What's that? Authority. What services canst thou do? I can keep honest counsel. Ride. Run. <laughs> Mar a curious tale in telling it, and deliver a plain message bluntly. That which ordinary men are fit for, I am qualified in, and the best of me is diligence. How old art thou? Not so young, sir, to love a woman for singing, nor so old to dote on her for anything. I have years on my back forty-eight. Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part from thee yet. Dinner! Oh, dinner! Where's my knave, my fool? Go you and call my fool hither. Exit second night. Enter Oswald. You! You, Sarah, where's my daughter? So please you. Exit. What says the fellow there? Call the clock pole back. Exit third night. Where's my fool? Oh, I think the world's asleep. Enter third night. How now? Where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Why came not the slave back to me when I called him? Sir, he answered me. In the roundest manner. He would not. He would not? My lord, I know not what the matter is. But to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well in the general dependence as in the duke himself also, and your daughter. Ha! Huh, sayst thou so? I beseech you pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken, for my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wronged. Thou but rememberest me of mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late, which I have rather blamed as mine own jealous curiosity, than as a very pretence and purpose of unkindness. I will look further into it. But where's my fool? I have not seen him these two days. Since my young lady's going into France, sir, the fool hath much pined away. No more of that. I have noted it well. Go you and tell my daughter I would speak with her. Exit third night. Go you, call hither my fool. Exit another night. Enter Oswald. Oh, you, sir, you, come hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lady's father? My lord's knave, you horse and dog, you slave, you cur. I am none of these, my lord. I beseech your pardon. Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? He strikes him. I'll not be struck, my lord. Nor tripped neither, you base football player. He trips him. I thank thee, fellow. Thou serves me, and I love thee. To Oswald. Come, sir. Arise. Away. I'll teach you differences. Away. Away. If you will measure your lubber's length again, tarry. But... Away! Go to! Have you wisdom? He pushes Oswald out. So? Now, my friendly knave, I thank thee. There's earnest of thy service. He gives him money. Enter the fool. Let me hire him, too. Here's my coxcomb. How now, my pretty knave? How dost thou? Sirrah, you were best take my coxcomb. <laughs> Why, fool? Why, for taking one's part that's out of favour. Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits. Thou'lt catch cold shortly. There, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow hath banished two one's daughters, and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. How now, Nuncle? Would I had two coxcombs and two daughters? Why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I'd keep my coxcombs myself. There's mine. Beg another of thy daughters. Take heed, Sarah. The whip? Truth the dog must to kennel. He must be whipped out, when the Lady Brock may stand by the fire and stink. A pestilent gall to me. Sirrah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, Nuncle. Have more than thou showest. Speak less than thou knowest, lend less than thou owest, ride more than thou goest, learn more than thou trowest, set less 
than thou throwest. Leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. Hm, this is nothing, fool. Then tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. Can you make no use of nothing, Nuncle? Why, no, boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. To Kent. Prithee tell him, so much the rent of his land comes to, he will not believe a fool. A bitter fool. Dost thou know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? No, lad, teach me. That lord that counselled thee to give away thy land, come place him here by me. Do thou for him stand. The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. The one in motley here, the other found out there. Dost thou call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away that thou wast born with. This is not altogether fool, my lord. No faith. Lords and great men will not let me. If I had a monopoly out, they would have part on't and loads too. They will not let me have all the fool to myself. They'll be snatching, Nuncle. Give me an egg, and I'll give thee two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? Why, after I've cut the egg in the middle, and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. When thou clovest thy crown in the middle, and gavest away both parts, thou borest thine ass on thy back o'er the dirt. Thou hadst little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest thy golden one away. If I speak like myself in this, let him be whipped that first finds it so. Fools had ne'er less grace in a year, For wise men are grown foppish, And know not how their wits to wear, Their manners are so apish. When were you wont to be so full of songs, sirrah? I have used it, Nuncle, ere since thou madest thy daughters thy mothers, for when thou gavest them the rod, and puttest down thine own breeches, then they for sudden joy did weep, and I for sorrow sung, that such a king should play bo-peep, and go the fools among. Prithee, Nuncle, keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. And you lie, sirrah, we'll have you whipped. I marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are. They'll have me whipped for speaking true. They'll have me whipped for lying. And sometimes I am whipped for holding my peace. I had rather be any kind of thing than a fool, and yet I would not be thee, Nuncle. Thou hast paired thy wit on both sides and left nothing in the middle. Here comes one of the pairings. Enter Goneril. How now, daughter? What makes that frontal don? Methinks thou art too much of late i' the frown. Thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning. Now thou art an o without a figure. I am better than thou art. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. To Goneril. Yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue. So to your face bids me, though you say nothing, Mum, mum, he that keeps nor crust nor crumb, weary of all shall want some. He points to Lear. That's a shield peas cod. Not only, sir, this your all-licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. Sir, I had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress, but now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoken done that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance which if you should, the fault would not scape censure, nor the redresses sleep, which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might in their working do you that offence which else were shame, that then necessity will call discreet proceeding. For you know, Nunco, the hedge-sparrow fed the cuckoo so long that it had its head bit off by it young. So out went the candle, and we were left darkling. Are you our daughter? Come, sir, I would you would make use of that good wisdom whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions that of late transform you from what you rightly are. May not an ass know when the cart draws the horse? Whoop! Jug! I love thee. Doth any here know me? This is not Lear, 
Doth Lear walk thus, speak thus? Where are his eyes? Either his notion weakens, his discernings are lethargied. Ah, oh, waking, tis not so. Who is it that can tell me who I am? Lear's shadow. I would learn that, for by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge, and reason, I should be false persuaded I had daughters. Which they will make an obedient father. Your name, fair gentlewoman? This admiration, sir, is much of the favour of your other new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright. As you are old and reverend, you should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this our court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust make it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced place. The shame itself doth speak for instant remedy. Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs, a little to disquantity your train, and the remainder that shall still depend, to be such men as may besort your age, which know themselves and you. Darkness and devils, saddle my horses, call my train together. Degenerate bastard, I'll not trouble thee. Yet have I left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Enter Albany. Woe that too late repents. Oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir. Prepare my horses. Ingratitude, thou marble-hearted fiend, more hideous when thou show'st thee in a child than the sea-monster. Pray, sir, be patient. To Goneril. Detested kite, thou liest. My train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. O oh, most small fault, how ugly didst thou in Cordelia show, which like an engine wrenched my frame of nature from the fixed place, drew from my heart all love, and added to the gall. O oh, Lear, 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 beat at this gate that let thy folly in, he strikes his head, and thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people. Exeunt Kent and Knights. My lord, I am guiltless, as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. He kneels. Hear, nature, hear, dear goddess, hear. Suspend thy purpose, if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase. And from her derogate body never spring a babe to honour her. If she must teem, create her child of spleen, that it may live and be a thwart disnatured torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth, with cadent tears fret channels in her cheeks. Turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt, that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Away! Away! Exit. Now, gods that we adore, Whereof comes this? Never afflict yourself to know more of it, but let his disposition have that scope that dotage gives it. Enter Lear. What, fifty of my followers at a clap within a fortnight? What's the matter, sir? To Goneril. I'll tell thee life and death. I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus, that these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worth them, Blasts and fogs upon thee, the untented woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Old fond eyes beweep this cause again, I'll pluck you out, and cast you with the waters that you lose to temper clay. Ha! Ah, let it be so, I have another daughter, who I am sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear of this with her nails, she'll flay thy wolfish visage. Thou shalt find that I'll resume the shape which thou dost think I have cast off for ever. Exit. Do you mark that? I cannot be so partial, Gonril, to the great love I bear you. Pray you content. What, Oswald, ho! To the fool. You, sir, more knave than fool, after your master. No collier, no collier, tarry, take the fool with thee. A fox, when one has caught her, and such a daughter, should sure to the slaughter, if my cap would buy a halter, so the fool follows after. Exit. This man hath had good counsel. A hundred knights, 
"'Tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred knights. "'Yes, that on every dream, each buzz, each fancy, each complaint, dislike, "'he may engard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy. "'Oswald, I say!' "'Well, you may fear too far.' "'Safer than trust too far. "'Let me still take away the harms I fear, not fear still to be taken. "'I know his heart. "'What he hath uttered I have writ to my sister. "'If she sustain him in his hundred nights, when I have showed the unfitness—' Enter Oswald. How now, Oswald? What, have you writ that letter to my sister? Ay, madam. Take you some company, and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear, and thereto add such reasons of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone, and hasten your return. Exit Oswald. No, no, my lord. This milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn it not, yet under pardon you are much more attasked for want of wisdom than praised for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce I cannot tell. Striving to better oft we mar what's well. Nay, then. Well, well, the event. Exeunt. Scene five. Court before the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Lear, Kent, the fool, and a gentleman. To Kent. Go you before to Gloucester with these letters. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know that comes from her demand out of the letter. If your diligence be not speedy, I shall be there for you. I will not sleep, my lord, until I have delivered your letter. Exit. If a man's brains were in his heels, were it not in danger of kibes? Ay, boy. Then I prithee be merry. Thy wit shall not go slipshod. Ha, ha, ha. Shalt see thy other daughter will use thee kindly, for though she's as like this as a crab's like an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. What canst tell, boy? She'll taste as like this, as a crab does to a crab. Thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle of one's face? No. Why, to keep one's eyes of either side's nose, that what a man cannot smell out he may spy into. I did her wrong. Canst tell how an oyster makes his shell? No. Nor I neither. But I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why to put his head in, not to give it away to his daughters, and leave his horns without a case. I will forget my nature, so kind a father. Be my horses ready? Thy asses are gone about em. The reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they are not eight? Yes, indeed. Thou wouldst make a good fool. To take it again, perforce. Monster ingratitude. If thou wert my fool, nuncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. How's that? Thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Oh, let me not be mad, not mad, sweet heaven. Keep me in temper, I would not be mad. How now? Are the horses ready? Ready, my lord. Come, boy. Exeunt all except the fool. She that's a maid now, and laughs at my departure, shall not be a maid long, unless things be cut shorter. Exit. End of Act One, King Lear. Act Two of King Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Lear by William Shakespeare. Act Two. Scene One. A court within the castle of the Earl of Gloucester. Enter Edmund and Curran, meeting. Save thee, Curran. And you, sir. I have been with your father, and given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Regan, his duchess, will be here with him this night. How comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. Not I. Pray you, what are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward, twixt the two Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do, then, in time. Fare you well, sir. 
Exit. The Duke be here to-night? The better. Best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. My father hath set guard to take my brother, and I have one thing of a queasy question which I must act. Briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word. Descend. Brother, I say. Enter Edgar. My father watches. Sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? He is coming hither, now with the night, in haste, and Regan with him. Have you said nothing upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I am sure on't, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning I must draw my sword upon you. Draw, seem to defend yourself. Now quit you well. Yield! Come before my father. Light! Ho here! Fly, brother! Torches! Torches! So farewell. Exit Edgar. Some blood drawn on me would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavour. I have seen drunkards do more than this in sport. He wounds himself in the arm. Father! Father! Stop! Stop! No help! Enter Gloucester and servants with torches. Now, Edmund, where's the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. But where is he? Look, sir, I bleed. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir, when by no means he could— Pursue him, ho! Go after. Exeunt some servants. By no means what? Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. But that I told him the revenging gods against patricides did all their thunders bend. Spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was bound to the father, sir, in fine. Seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose, in fell motion with his prepared sword, he charges home with my unprovided body, lanced mine arm. But when he saw my best alarmed spirits, bold in the quarrel's right, roused to the encounter, or whether gasted by the noise I made, full suddenly he fled. Let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught, and found dispatched. The noble duke, my master, my worthy arch and patron, comes to-night. By his authority I will proclaim it, that he which finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous coward to the stake, he that conceals him, death. When I dissuaded him from his intent, and found him pite to do it with cursed speech, I threatened to discover him. He replied, Thou unpossessing bastard! Dost thou think, if I would stand against thee, would the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worth in thee make thy words faithed? No. What I should deny, as this I would. Aye. Though thou didst produce my very character, I'd turn it all to thy suggestion, plot, and damned practice. And thou must make a dullard of the world, if they not thought the profits of my death were very pregnant and potential spurs to make thee seek it. Strong and fastened villain. Would he deny his letter? I never got him. Hark, the duke's trumpets. I know not why he comes. All ports I'll bar. The villain shall not scape. The duke must grant me that. Besides, his picture I will send far and near, that all the kingdom may have due note of him, and of my land, loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. Enter Cornwall, Regan, and attendants. How now, my noble friend? Since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short, which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? O oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What? Did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named... 
your Edgar. O oh, lady, lady, shame would have it hid. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that tend upon my father? I know not, madam. It is too bad, too bad. Yes, madam, he was of that consort. No marvel, then, though he were ill-affected, tis they have put him on the old man's death, to have the expense and waste of his revenues. I have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them, and with such cautions that if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I assure thee, Regan. Edmund, I hear that you have shown your father a childlike office. "'Twas my duty, sir. "'He did bewray his practice, "'and received this hurt you see, "'striving to apprehend him. "'Is he pursued? "'Ay, my good lord. "'If he be taken, "'he shall never more be feared of doing harm. "'Make your own purpose, "'how in my strength you please. "'For you, Edmund, "'whose virtue and obedience "'doth this instant so much commend itself, "'you shall be ours.' Natures of such deep trust we shall much need. You we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. You know not why we came to visit you. Thus out of season, threading dark-eyed night, occasions noble Gloucester of some boys, wherein we must have use of your advice. Our father he hath writ, so hath our sister of differences which I best thought it fit to answer from our home, the several messengers from hence attend dispatch. Our good old friend lay comforts to your bosom, and bestow your needful counsel to our business, which craves the instant use. I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Exeunt. Flourish. Scene two, before Gloucester's castle. Enter Kent and Oswald severally. Good dawning to thee, friend. Art of this house? Ay. Where may we set our horses? <laughs> In the mire. Prithee, if thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why then, I care not for thee. If I had thee in Lipsbury, Penfold. I would make thee care for me. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worsted-stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking, horsen, Glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue, One trunk inheriting slave, One that wouldst be a bod in a way of good service, And art nothing but the composition of a knave, Beggar, coward, pander, And the son and heir of a mongrel bitch, One whom I will beat into clamorous whining, If thou deniest the least syllable. Of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow art thou, Thus to rail on one that's neither known of thee nor knows thee. Oh, what a brazen-faced varlet art thou, To deny thou know'st me. Is it two days ago since I beat thee, And tripped up thy heels before the king? Draw, you rogue, for though it be night, Yet the moon shines. I'll make a sop of the moonshine of you. Draw, you horse and cullen, ye barber-monger, draw! Uh, away! I have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you rascal! You come with letters against the king, and take vanity, the puppet's part, against the royalty of her father. Draw, you rogue, or I'll so carbonado your shanks. Draw, you rascal! Come your ways! Help! Ho! Oh, murder! Help! Strike, you slave! Oswald tries to escape. Stand, rogue! Stand! You need slave, strike! He beats him. 
Help! Oh! Murder! Murder! Enter Edmund Cornwall, Regan Gloucester, and servants. How now? What's the matter? Uh, with you, Goodman boy, and you please. Come, I'll flesh you. Come on, young master. Weapons, arms, what's the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives. He dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I am scarce in breath, my lord. Ah, no marvel. You have so bestirred your valour. You cowardly rascal. Nature disclaims in thee. A tailor made thee. Thou art a strange fellow. A tailor make a man. Aye, a tailor, sir. A stone-cutter or a painter could not have made him so ill, though he had been but two hours at the trade. To Oswald. Speak yet. How grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared at suit of his grey beard. Thou horse and zed, thou unnecessary letter. My lord, if you'll give me leave, I will tread this unbolted villain into mortar, and daub the walls of a jakes with him. Spare my grey beard, you wagtail. Peace, sirrah, you beastly knave. Know you no reverence? Yes, sir, but anger hath. A privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a knave as this should wear a sword, who wears no honesty. Such smiling rogues as these, like rats, off bite the holy cords a twain, which are too entrenched to loose, smooth every passion that in the natures of their lords rebel, bring oil to the fire, snow to their colder moods, reneg, affirm, and turn their halcyon beaks with every gale and vary of their masters, knowing not, like dogs, but following. A plague upon your epileptic visage, smile you my speeches, as if I were a fool, goose, and I had you upon Sarum plain, I drive ye cackling home to Camelot. What? Art thou mad, old fellow? How fell you out? Say that. No contraries hold more antipathy than I and such a knave. Why dost thou call him knave? What is his fault? His countenance likes me not. No more, perchance, does mine, or his, or hers. Sir, "'Tis my preoccupation to be plain. "'I have seen better faces in my time "'than stands on any shoulder "'that I see before me at this instant. "'This is some fellow, "'who, having been praised for bluntness, "'doth affect a saucy roughness, "'and constrains the garb quite from his nature. "'He cannot flatter. "'He, an honest mind and plain, "'he must speak truth, "'and they will take it so.' If not, he's plain. These kinds of knaves, I know which in this plainness, harbour more craft and more corrupter ends than twenty silly ducking observants that stretch their duties nicely. Sir, in good faith, in sincere verity, under the allowance of your great aspect, whose influence, like the wreath of radiant fire on flickering Phoebus's front. What meanst by this? to go out of my dialect, which you discommend so much. I know, sir, I am no flatterer. He that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain knave, which, for my part, I will not be, though I should win your displeasure to entreat me to it. What was the offence you gave him? I never gave him any. It pleased the king, his master, very late, to strike at me, upon his misconstruction, when he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put upon him such a deal of man that worthied him, got praises of the king for him attempting who was self-subdued, and, in the fleshment of this dread exploit, drew on me here again. 
None of these rogues and cowards, but Ajax is their fool. Fetch forth the stocks. You stubborn ancient knave, you reverent braggart, we'll teach you. Hmm, sir, I am too old to learn. Call not your stocks for me. I serve the king, on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do small respect, show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stocking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks. As I have life and honour, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon, till night, my lord, and all night too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same colour our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Stocks brought out. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. Your purposed low correction is such as basest and contemptedest wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with. The king must take it ill that he, so slightly valued in his messenger, should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse, to have a gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Put in his legs. Kent is put in the stocks. Exeunt all but Gloucester and Kent. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the duke's pleasure, whose disposition all the world well knows, will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray, do not, sir. I have watched and travelled hard. Some time I shall sleep out. The rest I'll whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out at heels. Give you good morrow. The duke's to blame in this. Twill be ill taken. Exit. Good king, that must approve the common saw. Thou out of heaven's benediction comest to the warm sun. Approach thou beacon to this under-globe, that by thy comfortable beams I may peruse this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. I know tis from Cordelia, who hath most fortunately been informed of my obscured course, and shall find time from this enormous state, seeking to give losses their remedies, all weary and overwatched. Take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more. <sighs> Turn thy wheel. Hmm. He sleeps. Scene three, the open country. Enter Edgar. I heard myself proclaimed, and, by the happy hollow of a tree, escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place, that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. While I may escape, I will preserve myself, and am bethought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury, in contempt of man, brought near to beast. My face I'll grime with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my hair in knots, and with present nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars, who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms, pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep-cuts and mills, sometime with lunatic bands, sometime with prayers, enforce their charity. 
Poor Turley God. Poor Tom. That's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Exit. Scene 4. Before Gloucester's Castle. Kent is still in the stocks. Enter Lear, the fool, and a gentleman. "'Tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. As I learned, the night before there was no purpose in them of this remove. Hail to thee, noble master. Ha! Huh. Makes thou this shame thy pastime? Hmm. No, my lord. Ha ha! He wears cruel garters. Horses are tied by the head, dogs and bears by the neck, monkeys by the loins, and men by the legs. When a man is over lusty at legs, then he wears wooden nether stocks. What's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say, yea. No, no, they would not. Yes, they have. By Jupiter, I swear, no. By Juno, I swear, I. They durst not do it. They would not, could not do it. Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. Resolve me with all modest haste, which way thou mightst deserve or they impose this usage coming from us. My lord, when at their home I did commend your highness's letters to them, ere I was risen from the place that showed my duty kneeling, came there a reeking post, stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Goneril, his mistress' salutations, delivered letters, spite of intermission, which presently they read, on whose contents they summoned up their many, straight took horse, commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer gave me cold looks, and meeting here the other messenger, whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter, found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Winter's not gone yet, if the wild geese fly that way. Fathers that wear rags do make their children blind, but fathers that bear bags shall see their children kind. Fortune, that errant whore, ne'er turns the key to the poor, but for all this Thou shalt have as many dollars for thy daughters as thou canst tell in a year. Oh, how this mother swells up toward my heart! Hysterica, passia, down thy climbing sorrow, thy elements below. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, here within. Follow me not. Stay here. Exit. Made you no more offence but what you speak of? None. How chance the king comes with so small a number? And thou hadst been set in the stocks for that question. Thou hadst well deserved it. <laughs> Why, fool? We'll set thee to school to an ant, to teach thee there's no laboring in the winter. All that follow their noses are led by their eyes, but blind men. And there's not a nose among twenty but can smell him that's stinking. Let go thy hold when a great wheel runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following it. But the great one that goes up the hill, let him draw thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That, sir, which serves and seeks for gain, and follows but for form, will pack when it begins to rain, and leave thee in the storm. 
But I will tarry, the fool will stay, and let the wise man fly. The knave turns fool that runs away, the fool no knave perdy. Where learned you this fool? Not in the stocks, fool. Enter Lear and Gloucester. Deny to speak with me. They are sick. They are weary. They have travelled all the night. Mere fetches. The images of revolt and flying off. Pitch me a better answer. My dear lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke, how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery. What quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I'll speak with the duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them so. Informed them? Dost thou understand me, man? Ay, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak. Commands her service. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood. Fiery, the fiery duke. Tell the hot duke that... No, but not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office. Where to our health is bound, we are not ourselves. When nature, being oppressed, commands the mind to suffer with the body, I'll forbear, and am fallen out with my more headier will, to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. Death on my state! Wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only— Give me my servant forth. Go tell the duke and wife I'd speak with them, now, presently. Bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Exit. Oh, me, my heart, my rising heart, but down. Cry to it, Nuncle, as the cockney did to the eels when she put him in a paste alive, she napped them o' the coxcombs with a stick and cried, Down, wantons, down! T'was her brother that, in pure kindness to his horse, buttered his hay. Enter Cornwall, Regan, Gloucester, and servants. Good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. Kent is here set at liberty. I am glad to see your highness. Regan, I think you are. I know what reason I have to think so. If thou shouldst not be glad, I would divorce me from thy mother's tomb, sepulchring an adulteress. To Kent. Oh, are you free? Some other time for that. Beloved Regan, thy sister's naught. Oh, Regan, she hath tied sharp toothed and kindness like a vulture. Here! Laying his hand on his heart. I can scarce speak to thee. Thou'll not believe with how depraved a quality. Oh, Regan. I pray you, sir. Take patience. I have hope you less know how to value her desert than she to scan her duty. Say, how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If so, perchance, she have restrained the riots of your followers. Tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curse is on her. Oh, sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore I pray you that to our sister you do make return. Say you have wronged her, sir. Ask her forgiveness. Do you but mark how this becomes the house? He kneels. Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. On my knees I beg that you'll vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good, sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Rising. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue, most serpent-like, upon the very heart. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ingrateful top, Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness. Fie, sir, fie. You nimble lightnings, dart your blinding flames into her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fen such fogs, drawn by the powerful sun, to fall and blast her pride. Oh, the blessed gods, so will you wish on me when the rash mood is on. 
"'No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. "'Thy tender-hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. "'Her eyes are fierce, but thine do comfort and not burn. "'Tis not in thee to grudge my pleasures, "'to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words, "'to scant my sizes, "'and in conclusion to oppose the bolt against my coming in. "'Thou better know'st the offices of nature, "'bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude.' Thy half of the kingdom hast thou not forgot, wherein I thee endowed. Good, sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? Papa. What trumpet's that? I know it. My sister's. This approves her letter, that she would soon be here. Enter Oswald. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows. Out, varlet, from my sight. What means, Your Grace? Who stocked my servant, Regan? I have good hope thou didst not know on't. Enter Goneril. Who comes here? Oh, heavens! If you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down and take my part. To Goneril. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard? Oh, Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds in dotage terms so. Oh, sides, you are too tough. Will you yet help? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir, but his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You? You did? I pray you, father, being weak, seem so, if till the expiration of your month. You will return in sojourn with my sister. Dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home, and out of that provision which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return to her, and fifty men dismissed? No, rather I abjure all ruse, and choose to wage against the enmity of the air, to be a comrade with the wolf and owl. Necessity's sharp pinch, return with her. Why, the hot-blooded France that dowerless took our youngest-born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne, and squire-like pension-beck, to keep base life afoot. Return with her. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. He points to Oswald. At your choice, sir. I prithee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter, or rather a disease that in my flesh, which I must needs call mine, thou art a boil, a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee, let shame come when it will. I do not call it, I do not bid the thunder-bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Mend when thou canst, be better at thy leisure. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan, I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. For those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old. And so. But she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? Yea, or so many, sith that both charge and danger speak against so great a number. How in one house should many people under due commands hold amity? Tis odd, almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants, or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack you, we would control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositories, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What, must I come to you with five and twenty, Regan? "'Said you so?' "'And speak it again, my lord, no more with me.' 
Those wicked creatures yet do look well favoured, when others are more wicked, not being the worst, stands in some rank of praise. To Goneril. I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet doth double five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty, ten or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? Oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest thing superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, you heavens, give me that patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not woman's weapons, water-drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags, I will have such revenges on you, both that all the world shall— I will do such things— what they are yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand floors, or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool, I shall go mad. Exeunt Lear, Gloucester, Kent, the Fall, and Gentleman. Let us withdraw. It will be a storm. This house is little. The old man and his people cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame hath put himself from rest, and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So I am purposed. Where is my lord of Gloucester? Followed the old man forth. He is returned. Enter Gloucester. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls to horse, but will I know not whither. Tis best to give him way. He leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on, and the high winds do sorely ruffle, for many miles about there's scarce a bush. O oh, sir, do willful men the injuries that they themselves procure, must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors, he is attended with a desperate train, and what they may incense him do being apt to have his ear abused. Wisdom bids fear. Shut up your doors, my lord. Tis a wild night. My Regan counsels well. Come out of the storm. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three of King Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Lear by William Shakespeare Act Three. Scene One A Heath A Storm with Thunder and Lightning Enter Kent and a Gentleman Meeting Who's there? Besides foul weather one minded like the weather, most unquietly. I know you. Where's the king? Contending with the fretful elements, bids the wind blow the earth into the sea, or swell the curled waters above the main, that things might change or cease, tears his white hair, which the impetuous blasts with eyeless rage catch in their fury and make nothing of, Strives in his little world of man to outscorn The to-and-fro conflicting wind and rain. This night, wherein the cub-drawn bear would crouch, The lion and the belly-pinched wolf Keep their fur dry, unbonneted he runs, And bids what will take all. But who is with him? None but the fool who labours to outjest His heart-struck injuries. Sir, I do know you, and dare, upon the warrant of my note, commend a dear thing to you. There is division, although, as yet the face of it be covered with mutual cunning, 
betwixt Albany and Cornwall, who have, as who have not, that their great stars thrown and set high, servants who seem no less, which are to France the spies and speculations intelligent of our state. What hath been seen, either in snuffs and packings of the dukes, or the hard rain which both of them have borne against the old kind king, or something deeper, whereof perchance these are but furnishings. But true it is, from France there comes a power into this scattered kingdom, who already, wise in our negligence, have secret feet in some of our best ports, and are at point to show their open banner. Now, to you, if on my credit you dare build so far to make your speed to Dover, you shall find some that will thank you making just report of how unnatural and bemadding sorrow the king hath cause to plain. I am a gentleman of blood and breeding, and from some knowledge and assurance offer this office to you. I will talk further with you. No, do not, for confirmation that I am much more than my outwall. Open this purse and take what it contains. If you shall see Cordelia, as fear not but you shall, show her this ring, and she will tell you who your fellow is that yet you do not know. Fie on this storm! I will go seek the king. Give me your hand. Have you no more to say? Few words, but to effect more than all yet, that when we have found the king, in which your pain that way, I'll this, he that first lights on him, hola the other. Exeunt severally. Scene two. Another part of the heath. The storm continues. Enter Lear and the fool. Blow, winds, and crack your cheeks! Rage! Blow, you cataracts and hurricanos! Spout till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks! You sulphurous and thought-executing fires! Vaunt couriers to oak-cleaving thunderbolts! Singe my white head, and thou, all shaking thunder! Strike flat the thick rotundity of the world! Crack nature's moulds! All Germans spill at once that making grateful man. O oh, Nuncle, court holy water in a dry house is better than this rain water out of the door. Good Nuncle, in, and ask thy daughter's blessing. Here's a night pities neither wise men nor fools. Rumble thy bellyful, spit, fire, spout, rain, no rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax you not, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet I call you servile ministers that will with two pernicious daughters join your high-engendered battle against a head so old and white as this. Oh, oh, tis foul. He that has a house to put his head in has a good headpiece. The codpiece that will house before the head has any, the head and he shall louse, so beggars marry many. The man that makes his toe, what he his heart should make, Shall of a corn cry woe, and turn his sleep to wake. For there was never yet fair woman, but she made mouths in a glass. Enter Kent. No, I will be the pattern of all patience. I will say nothing. <coughs> Who's there? Mary, here's grace in a codpiece. That's a wise man and a fool. Alas, sir, are you here? Things that love night love not such nights as these. 
Oh, the wrathful skies gallow the very wanderers of the dark, and make them keep their caves. Since I was man, such sheets of fire, such bursts of horrid thunder, <coughs> such groans of roaring wind and rain I never remember to have heard. Man's nature cannot carry the affliction, nor the fear. Let the great gods that keep this dreadful pother o'er our heads find out their enemies now. Tremble, thou wretch that hast within thee undivulged crimes, unwhipped of justice. Hide thee, thou bloody hand, thou perjured, and thou similar man of virtue that art incestuous, caitiff to pieces shake, that under covert and convenient seeming hast practised on man's life. Close pent-up guilts, Rive your concealing continents, and cry these dreadful summoners' grace. I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Alack, bareheaded, gracious, my lord, hard by here is a hovel. Some friendship will it lend you gainst the tempest, repose you there. Whilst I to this hard house, more harder than the stones whereof tis raised, which even but now, demanding after you, denied me to come in. Return, and force their scanted courtesy. Thy wits begin to turn. Come on, my boy, how dost, my boy? Art cold? I am cold myself. Where is this straw, my fellow? The art of our necessities is strange, that can make vile things precious. Come, your hovel, poor fool and knave. I have one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. He that has and a little tiny wit, with hey-ho, the wind and the rain, must make content with his fortunes fit, for the rain it raineth every day. True, boy, come, bring us to this hovel. Exeunt Lear and Kent. This is a brave night to cool a courtesan. I'll speak a prophecy ere I go. When priests are more in word than matter, when brewers mar their malt with water, when nobles are their tailors' tutors, no heretics burnt, but wenches suitors, when every case in law is right, no squire in debt, nor no poor knight, when slanders do not live in tongues, nor cut purses come not to throngs, when usurers tell their gold in the field, and bods and horrors do churches build, then shall the realm of Albion come to great confusion. Then comes the time, who lives to see it, that going shall be used with feet. This prophecy Merlin shall make, for I live before his time. Exit Scene three, a room in Gloucester's castle. Enter Gloucester and Edmund. Alack, alack, Edmund, I like not this unnatural dealing. When I desired their leave that I might pity him, they took from me the use of mine own house, charged me on pain of perpetual displeasure neither to speak of him, entreat for him, nor any ways sustain him. Most savage and unnatural! Go to, say you nothing. There is division betwixt the dukes, and a worse matter than that. I have received a letter this night. Tis dangerous to be spoken. I have locked the letter in my closet. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged home. There's part of a power already footed. We must incline to the king. I will seek him, and privily relieve him. Go you, and maintain talk with the duke that my charity be not of him perceived. If he ask for me, I am ill, and gone to bed. If I die for it, as no less is threatened me, the king, my old master, must be relieved. There is some strange thing toward, Edmund. Pray you, be careful. Exit. This courtesy, forbid thee, shall the duke instantly know, and of that letter, too. This seems a fair deserving, and must draw me 
that which my father loses, no less than all. The younger rises when the old doth fall. Exit Scene 4 A part of the heath with a hovel Storm continues Enter Lear, Kent, and the Fool Here is the place, my lord Good, my lord, enter The tyranny of the open night's too rough for nature to endure Let me alone Good, my lord, enter here Wilt break my heart? I had rather break mine own. Good my lord, enter. Thou thinkst tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin, so tis to thee. But where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. Thou'd shun a bear, but if thy flight lay towards the raging sea, thou'dst meet the bear in the mouth. When the mind's free, the body's delicate. The tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling, else save what beats there, filial ingratitude. Is it not as this mouth should tear this hand for lifting food to it? But I will punish home. No, I will weep no more. In such a night to shut me out, poor on, I will endure. In such a night as this, O oh, Regan Goneril, your your kind old father, whose frank heart gave all. Oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that. No more of that. Good, my lord, enter here. Prithee go in thyself. Seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. But I'll go in. In, boy, go first. You houseless poverty, nay, get thee in, I'll pray, and then I'll sleep. Exit the fool. Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, that by the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your loops and windows raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? Oh, I attain too little care of this. Take physic, pomp, Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, that thou mayst shake the superflux to them, and show the heavens more just. Adam and Arf, Adam and Arf, port harm. Enter the fool from the hovel. Come not in here, Nuncle, here's a spirit. Help me, help me. Give me thy hand. Who's there? A spirit, a spirit. He says his name's poor Tom. What art thou that dost grumble there in the straw? Come forth. Enter Edgar, disguised as poor Tom. Away! The foul fiend follows me. Through the sharp orthorn blows the cold wind. Hmm. Go to thy cold bed and warm thee. Didst thou give all to thy two daughters, and art thou come to this? Who gives anything to poor Tom? whom the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame, through ford and whirlpool, o'er bog and quagmire, that hath laid knives under his pillow, and halters in his pew, set ratsbane by his porridge, made him proud of heart to ride on a bay trotting horse over four-inched bridges to curse his own shadow for a traitor. Bless thy five wits. Tom's cold. Oh, do de do do de do de bless thee from whirlwind, star-blasting, and taking. Do poor Tom some charity, whom the foul fiend vexes. There could I have him now, and there, and there again, and there. What? Have his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldst thou save nothing? Didst thou give them all? Nay, he reserved a blanket, else we had been all shamed. Now all the plagues that in the pendulous air hang fated o'er men's faults light on thy daughters. He hath no daughter, sir. Death, traitor! Nothing could have subdued nature to such lowness but his unkind daughters. Is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have thus little mercy on their flesh? Judicious punishment! Twas this flesh begot those pelican daughters. Pillicock sat on Pillicock Hill. Hello, hello, Lulu.
This cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. Take heed of the foul fiend. Obey thy parents. Keep thy word justly. Swear not. Commit not with man's sworn spouse. Set not thy sweetheart on proud array. Tom's a cold. What hast thou been? A serving man, proud in heart and mind, that curled my hair, wore gloves in my cap, served the lust of my mistress's heart, and did the act of darkness with her. <laughs> Swore as many oaths as I spake words, and broke them in the sweet face of heaven, one that slept in the contriving of lust, and waked to do it. Wine loved I deeply, dice dearly, and in woman out paramoured the Turk. False of heart, light of air, bloody of hand, hog in sloth, fox in stealth, wolf in greediness, dog in madness, lion in prey. Let not the creaking of shoes nor the rustling of silks betray thy poor heart to woman. Keep thy foot out of brothel, thy hand out of placket, thy pen from lender's book, and defy the foul fiend. Still, through the hawthorn blows the cold wind, says some money. Dolphin, my boy, boy, says let him trot by. Why, thou wert better in thy grave than to answer with thy uncovered body this extremity of the skies? Is man no more than this? Consider him well. Thou owest the worm no silk, the beast no hide, the sheep no wool, the cat no perfume. Ha! Ah, here's three ones are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Off, off, you lendings. Come, unbutton here. He tears off his clothes. Prithee, Nuncle, be contented. Tis a naughty night to swim in. Now, a little fire in a wild field were like an old lecher's heart, a small spark, all the rest one's body cold. Look, here comes a walking fire. Enter Gloucester with a torch. This is the foul fiend flippity gibbet. He begins at curfew, and walks till the first cock. He gives the web and the pen, squints the eye, and makes the hair lip. Mildews the white wheat, and hurts the poor creature of earth. Swith old footed thrice the old, he met the nightmare and her ninefold. Bid her alight, and her troth plight, and aroint thee, witch, aroint thee. How fares your grace? What's he? To Gloucester. Who's there? What is't you seek? What are you there? Your names? Poor Tom, that eats the swimming frog, the toad, the tadpole, the walnut, and the water, that in the fury of his heart, when the foul fiend rages, eats cow dung for salads, swallows the old rat and the ditch dog, drinks the green mantle of the standing pool, who is whipped from tithing to tithing, and stocked, punished, and imprisoned, who hath had three suits to his back, six shirts to his body, horse to ride, and weapons to wear. But mice and rats and such small deer have been Tom's food for seven long year. Beware, my follower. Peace, smoking. Peace, thou fiend. What? Hath your grace no better company? The Prince of Darkness is a gentleman. Modo, he's called, and Mahu. Our flesh and blood, my lord, is grown so vile that it doth hate what gets it. Poor Tom's a cold. Go in with me. My duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands, though their injunction be to bar my doors, and let this tyrannous night take hold upon you. Yet have I ventured to come seek you out, and bring you where both fire and food is ready. First, let me talk with this philosopher. To Edgar. What is the cause of thunder? Good, my lord, take this offer, go into the house. I'll talk a word with this same learned Theban. To Edgar. What is your study? How to prevent the fiend and to kill vermin. Let me ask you one word in private. Lear and Edgar talk apart. Importune him once more to go, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. Canst thou blame him? His daughters seek his death. Ah, that good Kent! He said it would be thus, poor banished man. Thou sayest the king grows mad. 
I'll tell thee, friend, I am almost mad myself. I had a son, now outlawed from my blood. He sought my life, but lately, very late, I loved him, friend, no father his son dearer. True to tell thee, the grief hath crazed my wits. What a night's this! I do beseech your grace. Oh, cry you mercy, sir, noble philosophy, your company. Tom's a cold. In, fellow, there, into the hovel. Keep thee warm. Come, let's in all. This, this way, my lord. With him I will keep still with my philosopher. Good my lord, soothe him. Let him take the fellow. Take him you on. Sirrah, come on, go along with us. Come, good Athenian. No words, no words. Hush. Child Roland to the dark tower came. His word was still, fie, foe, and fum. I smell the blood of a British man. Exeunt. Scene five. A room in Gloucester's castle. Enter Cornwall and Edmund. I will have my revenge ere I depart his house. How, my lord, I may be censured, that nature thus gives way to loyalty, something fears me to think of. I now perceive it was not altogether your brother's evil disposition made him seek his death, but a provoking merit set a work by a reprovable badness in himself. How malicious is my fortune, that I must repent to be just! This is the letter he spoke of, which approves him an intelligent party to the advantages of France. Oh, heavens, that this treason were not, or not I the detector. Go with me to the Duchess. If the matter of this paper be certain, you have mighty business in hand. True or false, it hath made thee Earl of Gloucester. Seek out where thy father is, that he may be ready for our apprehension. If I find him comforting the king, it will stuff his suspicion more fully. I will persevere in my course of loyalty, though the conflict be sore between that and my blood. I will lay trust upon thee, and thou shalt find a dearer father in my love. Exeunt. Scene six, a chamber in a farmhouse adjoining the castle. Enter Gloucester, Lear, Kent, the Fool, and Edgar. Here is better than the open air. Take it, thankfully. I will piece out the comfort with what addition I can. I will not be long from you. All the power of his wits have given way to his impatience. The gods reward your kindness. Exit Gloucester. Fratteretto calls me, and tells me Nero is an angler in the lake of darkness. Pray, innocent, and beware the foul fiend. Prithee, Nuncle, tell me whether a madman be a gentleman or a yeoman. A king, a king? No, he's a yeoman that has a gentleman to his son, for he's a mad yeoman that sees his son a gentleman before him. To have a thousand with red burning spits come hissing in upon him. The foul fiend bites my back. He's mad that trusts in the tameness of a wolf, a horse's health, a boy's love, or a whore's oath. It shall be done. I will arraign them straight. To Edgar. Come, sit thou here, most learned justicer. To the fool. Thou, sapient sir, sit here. Now you she foxes. Look where he stands and glares. Wants thou eyes at trial, madam? Come o'er the bourne, Bessie, to me. Her boat hath a leak, and she must not speak. Why, she dares not come over to thee. The foul fiend haunts poor Tom in the voice of a nightingale. Hoppy dance cries in Tom's belly for two white herring. Croak not, black angel, I have no food for thee. How do you, sir? Stand you not so amazed? Will you lie down and rest upon the cushions? I'll see their trial first. Bring in their evidence. To Edgar. Thou, a robed man of justice, take thy place. To the fool. And thou, his yoke-fellow of equity, bench by his side. 
to Kent. You are of the commission, uh, sit you too. Let us deal justly. Sleepest or wakest thou, jolly shepherd? Thy sheep be in the corn, and for one blast of thy minikin mouth, thy sheep shall take no arm. The cat is grey. Arraign her first. Tis Goneril. I here take my oath before this honourable assembly. She kicked the poor king, her father. Come hither, mistress. Is your name Goneril? She cannot deny it. Cry you mercy. I took you for a joint stool. And here's another, whose warped looks proclaim what store her heart is made on. Stop her there! Arms, arms, sword, fire, corruption in the place! False justicer, why hast thou let her scape? Bless thy five wets. Oh, pity! Sir, where is the patience now that you so oft have boasted to retain? My tears begin to take his part so much they'll mar my counterfeiting. The little dogs and all, Trey, Blanche, and Sweetheart, see, they, they bark at me. Tom will throw his head at them. Avaunt, ye curs! Be thy mouth or black or white, tooth that poisons if it bite, mastiff, greyhound, mongrel, grim, hound or spaniel, brack or lem, or bobtail, tyke or trundle tail, Tom will make them weep and wail, for with throwing thus my head, dogs leap the hatch and all are fled. Do dee dee dee, sissa! Come, march to wakes and fairs and market towns. Poor Tom, thy horn is dry. Then let them anatomize Regan, see what breeds about her heart. Is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts? You, sir, I entertain you for one of my hundred, only I do not like the fashion of your garments. You'll say they are Persian, but let them be changed. Now, good my lord, lie here and rest a while. Make no noise, make no noise, draw the curtains. So, so, we'll go to supper in the morning. And I'll go to bed at noon. Enter Gloucester. Come hither, friend. Where is the king, my master? No, here, sir. But trouble him not. His wits are gone. Good friend, I prithee, take him in thy arms. I have o'erheard a plot of death upon him. There is a litter ready. Lay him in it, and drive towards Dover, friend, where thou shalt meet both welcome and protection. Take up thy master. If thou shouldst dally half an hour, his life with thine, and all that offer to defend him, stand in assured loss. Take up! Take up, and follow me, that will to some provision give thee quick conduct. Oppressed nature sleeps. This rest might yet have balmed thy broken sinews, which, if convenience will not allow, stand in hard cure. To the fool. Come, help to bear thy master. Come, come, away. Exeunt Kent, Gloucester, and the Fool, bearing off the king. When we our betters see bearing our woes, we scarcely think our miseries are foes. Who alone suffers, suffers most i' the mind, leaving free things and happy shows behind. But then the mind much sufferance doth o'er skip, when grief hath mates and bearing fellowship. How light and portable my pain seems now, When that which makes me bend makes the king bow. He childed as I fathered. Tarm away, mark the eye noises, and thyself bewray, When false opinion whose wrong thought defiles thee, In thy just proof repeals and reconciles thee. What will ap more to-night safe scape the king? Lurk, lurk. Exit. Scene seven. A room in Gloucester's castle. Enter Cornwall, Regan, Goneril, Edmund, and servants. To Goneril. Post speedily to my lord your husband. Show him this letter. 
The army of France is landed. Seek out the traitor Gloucester. Exeunt some servants. Hang him instantly. Pluck out his eyes. Leave him to my displeasure. Edmund, keep you our sister company. The revenges we are bound to take upon your traitorous father are not fit for your beholding. Advise the duke where you are going, to a most festinate preparation. We are bound to the like. Our posts shall be swift and intelligent betwixt us. Farewell, dear sister. Farewell, my lord of Gloucester. Enter Oswald. How now? Where's the king? My lord of Gloucester hath conveyed him hence. Some five or six and thirty of his knights, hot questrists after him, met him at gate, who, with some other of the lord's dependents, are gone with him towards Dover, where they boast to have well-armed friends. Get horses for your mistress. Exit Oswald. Farewell, sweet lord, and sister. Edmund, farewell. Exeunt Goneril and Edmund. Go seek the traitor Gloucester. Pinion him like a thief. Bring him before us. Exeunt servants. Though well we may not pass upon his life, without the form of justice, yet our power shall do a courtesy to our wrath, which men may blame, but not control. Enter Gloucester, brought in by two or three servants. Who's there? The traitor? Ingrateful fox, tis he. Bind fast his corky arms. What mean your graces? Good, my friends, consider you are my guests. Do me no foul play, friends. Bind him, I say. Servants tie his hands. Hard, hard, oh filthy traitor. Unmerciful lady as you are, I'm none. To this chair bind him. Villain, thou shalt find. Regan plucks his beard. By the kind gods, tis most ignobly done to pluck me by the beard. So white and such a traitor. Naughty lady, these hairs which thou dost ravish from my chin will quicken and accuse thee. I am your host. With robber's hands my hospitable favours you should not ruffle thus. What will you do? Come, sir, what letters had you late from France? Be simple answered, for we know the truth. And what confederacy have you with the traitors late-footed in the kingdom? To whose hands have you sent the lunatic king? Speak. I have a letter, guessingly set down, which came from one that's of a neutral heart, and not from one opposed. Cunning. And false. Where hast thou sent the king? To Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Wast thou not charged at peril? Wherefore to Dover? Let him first answer that. I am tied to the stake, and I must stand the course. Wherefore to Dover, sir? Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes, nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh stick boorish fangs. The sea, with such a storm as his bare head in hell-black night endured, would have buoyed up and quenched the stelled fires. Yet, poor old heart, he hope the heavens to reign. If wolves had at thy gate howled that stern time, thou shouldst have said, Good porter, turn the key. All cruels else subscribed, but I shall see the winged vengeance overtake such children. See it thou shalt never. Fellows, hold the chair. Upon these eyes of thine I'll set my foot. He that will think to live till he be old, give me some help, O oh, cruel, O oh, ye gods. One side will mock another, the other do. If you see vengeance. Hold your hand, my lord. I have served you ever since I was a child, but better service have I never done you than now to bid you hold. How now, you dog? If you did wear a beard upon your chin, I'd shake it on this quarrel. Cornwall draws his sword. What do you mean? My villain. He lunges at him. Nay then, come on, and take the chance of anger. He wounds Cornwall. Give me thy sword. A peasant stand up thus. She takes a sword and runs at him behind. Oh, I am slain. My lord, you have one eye left to see some mischief on him. Oh. He dies. 
lest it see more, prevent it. Out, vile jelly, where is thy lustre now? All dark and comfortless. Where's my son, Edmund? Edmund, enkindle all the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act. Thou treacherous villain, thou callst on him that hates thee. It was he that made the overture of thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. Oh, my follies! Then Edgar was abused. Kind gods, forgive me that, and prosper him. Go thrust him out at gates, and let him smell his way to Dover. Exit a servant with Gloucester. How is it, my lord? How look you? I have received a hurt. Follow me, lady. Turn out that eyeless villain. Throw this slave upon the dunghill. Regan, I bleed apace. Untimely comes this hurt. Give me your arm. Exit Cornwall, supported by Regan. I'll never care what wickedness I do, if this man come to good. If she live long, and in the end meet the old course of death, women will all turn monsters. Let's follow the old earl, and get the bedlam to lead him where he would. His roguish madness allows itself to anything. Go thou. I'll fetch some flax and whites of eggs to apply to his bleeding face. Now heaven help it. Exeunt by opposite doors. End of Act 3 Act 4 of King Lear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Lear by William Shakespeare Act 4 Scene 1 The Heath Enter Edgar Yet better thus, and known to be contemned, than still contemned and flattered, to be worst, the lowest and most dejected thing of fortune, stands still in esperance, lives not in fear. The lamentable change is from the best, the worst returns to laughter. Welcome, then, thou unsubstantial air that I embrace. The wretch that thou hast blown unto the worst owes nothing to thy blasts. Enter Gloucester, led by an old man. But who comes here? My father, poorly led. World, world, O oh world! But that thy strange mutations make us hate thee, life would not yield to age. O oh, my God! Good Lord, I have been your tenant and your father's tenant these fourscore years. Away, get thee away, good friend, be gone. Thy comforts can do me no good at all, thee they may hurt. You cannot see your way. I have no way, and therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw. Full oft tis seen our means secure us, and our mere defects prove our commodities. O oh, dear son, Edgar, the food of thy abused father's wrath, might I but live to see thee in my touch, I'd say I had eyes again. How now? Who's there? O oh, gods, who is to can say I am at the worst? I am worse than e'er I was. Tis poor, mad, Tom. And worse I may be yet. The worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. Fellow, where goest? Is it a beggar man? Madman and beggar too. He has some reason, else he could not beg. In the last night's storm I such a fellow saw, which made me think a man a worm. My son came then into my mind, and yet my mind was then scarce friends with him. I have heard more since. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. How should this be? Bad is the trade that must play fool to sorrow, angering itself and others. 
Bless thee, master. Is that the naked fellow? Ay, my lord. Then prithee get thee gone, if for my sake thou wilt o'ertake us, hence a mile or twain, in the way toward Dover, do it for ancient love, and bring some covering for this naked soul, which I'll entreat to lead me. Alack, sir, he is mad. Tis the time's plague when madmen lead the blind. Do as I bid thee, or rather do thy pleasure. Above the rest be gone. I bring him the best peril that I have. Command what will. Exit. Sirrah, naked fellow. Poor Tom's a cold. I cannot daub it further. Come hither, fellow. And yet I must. Bless thy sweet eyes, they plead. Knowest thou the way to Dover? Both stile and gate, arseway and footpath. Poor Tom hath been scared out of his good wit. Bless thee, good man's son, from the foul fiend. Five fiends have been in poor Tom at once. Of lust, as Obidicut, Obididens, Prince of Dumbness, Mahu of stealing, Modo of murder, Flippity Gibbet of mopping and mowing, who since possesses chambermaids and waiting women. So bless thee, master. Here, take this purse, thou whom the heaven's plagues have humbled to all strokes, that I am wretched makes thee the happier. Heavens, deal so still. Let the superfluous and lust-dieted man that slaves your ordinance, that will not see because he does not feel, feel your power quickly. So distribution should undo excess, and each man have enough. Dost thou know Dover? Aye, master. There is a cliff whose high and bending head looks fearfully in the confined deep. Bring me but to the very brim of it, and I'll repair the misery thou dost bear with something rich about me. From that place I shall no leading need. Give me thy arm. Poor Tom shall lead thee. Exeunt. Scene two. Before the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Goneril and Edmund, Oswald meeting them. Welcome, my lord. I marvel our mild husband not met us on the way. Now where's your master? Madam, within. But never a man so changed. I told him of the army that was landed. He smiled at it. I told him you were coming. His answer was the worse. Of Gloucester's treachery and the loyal service of his son, when I informed him, then he called me sot, and told me I had turned the wrong side out. What most he should dislike seems pleasant to him, what like offensive. To Edmund. Then shall you go no further. It is the cowish terror of his spirit that dares not undertake. He'll not feel wrongs which tie him to an answer. Our wishes on the way may prove effects. Back, Edmund, to my brother. Hasten his musters and conduct his powers. I must change arms at home, and give the distaff into my husband's hands. This trusty servant shall pass between us. Ere long you are like to hear, if you dare venture in your own behalf, a mistress's command. Giving a favour. Wear this, spare speech, decline your head. This kiss, if it durst speak, would stretch thy spirits up into the air. Conceive, and fare thee well. Yours in the ranks of death. My most dear Gloucester. Exit Edmund. Oh, the difference of man and man! To thee a woman's services are due. My fool usurps my body. Madam, here comes my lord. Exit. Enter Albany. I have been worth the whistle. Oh, Goneril. You are not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. I fear your disposition. That nature which contemns it, origin, cannot be bordered certain in itself. She that herself will sliver and disbranch from her material sap, must perforce wither and come to deadly use. No more. The text is foolish. Wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile. Filth savor but themselves. What have you done? Tigers, not daughters. What have you performed? A father, and a gracious, aged man, whose reverence even the head-lugged bear would lick. Most barbarous! 
most degenerate. Have you madded? Could my good brother suffer you to do it? A man, a prince, by him so benefited. If that the heavens do not their visible spirits send quickly down to tame these vile offences, it will come. Humanity must perforce prey on itself, like monsters of the deep. Milk-livered man, the barest a cheek for blows, a head for wrongs, who hast not in thy brows an eye discerning thine honour from thy suffering, that not knowest fools do those villains pity who are punished, ere they have done their mischief. Where's thy drum? France spreads his banners in our noiseless land. With plumed helm thy slayer begins threats, whilst thou, a moral fool, sitst still and criest, Alack, why does he so? See thyself, devil! Proper deformity seems not in the fiend so horrid as in woman. O oh, vain fool! Thou changed and self-covered thing, for shame! Bemonster not thy feature, were my fitness to let these hands obey my blood. They are apt enough to dislocate and tear thy flesh and bones. Howe'er thou art a fiend, a woman's shape doth shield thee. Marry your manhood now. Enter a messenger. What news? Oh, my good lord, the Duke of Cornwall's dead, slain by his servant, going to put out the other eye of Gloucester. Gloucester's eyes. A servant that he bred, thrilled with remorse, opposed against the act, bending his sword to his great master, who, thereat enraged, flew on him, and amongst them felt him dead, but not without that harmful stroke which since hath plucked him after. This shows you are above, you justicers, that these our nether crimes so speedily can venge. But, oh, poor Gloucester, lost he his other eye? Both, both, my lord. This letter, madam, craves a speedy answer. Tis from your sister. One way I like this well, but being widow and my Gloucester with her, may all the building in my fancy pluck upon my hateful life. Another way the news is not so tart. I'll read an answer. Exit. Where was his son when they did take his eyes? Come with my lady hither. He is not here. No, my good lord, I met him back again. Knows he the wickedness? Ay, my good lord, t'was he informed against him, and quit the house on purpose, that their punishment might have the freer course. Gloucester, I live to thank thee for the love thou showedst the king, and to revenge thine eyes. Come hither, friend, tell me what more thou knowst. Exeunt Scene three, The French Camp Near Dover Enter Kent and a gentleman. Why the king of France is so suddenly gone back, know you the reason? Something he left imperfect in the state, which, since his coming forth is thought of, which imports to the kingdom so much fear and danger, that his personal return was most required and necessary. Who hath he left behind him general? The Marechal of France, Monsieur Lefar. Did... Your letters pierce the queen to any demonstration of grief? Ay, sir, she took them, read them in my presence, and now and then an ample tear trilled down her delicate cheek. It seemed she was a queen over her passion, who, most rebel-like, sought to be king o'er her. Oh, then it moved her. Not to a rage— Patience and sorrow strove who should express her goodliest. You have seen sunshine and rain at once. Her smiles and tears were like a better day. Those happy smilets that played on her ripe lip seemed not to know what guests were in her eyes, which parted thence as pearls from diamonds dropped. In brief, sorrow would be a rarity most beloved, if all could so become it. Made she... No verbal question. Faith, once or twice she heaved the name of Father, pantingly forth, as if it pressed her heart, cried, Sisters, sisters, shame of ladies! Sisters, Kent, father, sisters, what, i' the storm, i' the night? Let pity not be believed. There she shook the holy water from her heavenly eyes, and clamour moistened, then away she started to deal with grief alone. 
It is the stars. The stars above us govern our conditions. Else one self, mate and mate, could not beget such different issues. You spoke not with her sense. No. Was this before the king returned? No, since. Well, sir, the poor distressed leers in the town, who sometime, in his better tune, remembers what we are come about, and by no means will yield to see his daughter. Why, good sir? A sovereign shame so elbows him, his own unkindness, that stripped her from his benediction, turned her to foreign casualties, gave her dear rights to his dog-hearted daughters. These things sting his mind so venomously that burning shame detains him from Cordelia. Alack, poor gentleman! Of Albany's and Cornwall's powers you heard not? Tis so. They are afoot. Well, sir, I'll bring you to our master Lear, and leave you to attend him. Some dear cause will in concealment wrap me up a while. When I am known aright, you shall not grieve lending me this acquaintance. I pray you go along with me. Exeunt. Scene four. The French camp. A tent. Enter Cordelia, physician and soldiers. Alack, tis he. Why, he was met even now as mad as the vexed sea, singing aloud, crowned with rank fumiter and furrow weeds, with harlocks, hemlock, nettles, cuckoo flowers, darnel, and all the idle weeds that grow in our sustaining corn. To soldiers. A century send forth, search every acre in the high-grown field, and bring him to our eye. Exeunt soldiers. To physician. What can man's wisdom in the restoring his bereaved sense? He that helps him take all my outward worth. There is means, madam. Our foster nurse of nature is a repose, the which he lacks. That to provoke in him are many simples operative, whose power will close the eye of anguish. All blessed secrets, all you unpublished virtues of the earth, spring with my tears. Be aidant and remediate in the good man's distress. Seek, seek for him, lest his ungoverned rage dissolve the life that wants the means to lead it. Enter a messenger. News, madam. The British powers are marching hitherward. Tis known before. Our preparation stands in expectation of them. O oh, dear father, it is thy business that I go about. Therefore great France my mourning and important tears hath pitied. No blown ambition doth our arms incite, But love, dear love, and our aged father's right. Soon may I hear and see him. Exeunt Scene five, A room in Gloucester's castle. Enter Regan and Oswald. But are my brother's powers set forth? Ay, madam. Himself in person there? Madam, with much ado, your sister is the better soldier. Lord Edmund spake not with your lord at home? No, madam. What might import my sister's letter to him? I know not, lady. Faith, he has posted ends on serious matter. It was great ignorance, Gloucester's eyes being out. To let him live where he arrives, he moves all hearts against us. Edmund, I think, is gone, in pity of his misery, to dispatch his knighted life, moreover, to descry the strength of the enemy. I must needs after him, madam, with my letter. Our troops set forth to-morrow. Stay with us. The ways are dangerous. I may not, madam. My lady charged my duty in this business. Why should she write to Edmund? Might not you transport her purposes by word? But like something, I know not what. I'll love thee much. Let me unseal the letter. Madam, I had rather— I know your lady does not love her husband. I am sure of that. And at her late being here, she gave strange eyelids and most speaking looks 
to noble Edmund. I know you are of a bosom. I, madam? I speak in understanding. You are, I know it. Therefore I do advise you, take this note. My lord is dead. Edmund and I have talked, and more convenient is he for my hand than for your lady's. You may gather more if you do find him. Pray you give him this. And when your mistress is thus much from you, I pray desire her call, her wisdom to her. So fare you well, and if you do chance to hear of that blind traitor, preferment falls on him that cuts him off. Would I could meet him, madam. I should show what party I do follow. Fare thee well. Exeunt. Scene six. The country near Dover. Enter Gloucester and Edgar, dressed as a peasant. When shall I come to the top of that same hill? You do climb up it now. Look how we labour. Methinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark, do you hear the sea? No, truly. Why, then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes' anguish. So may it be indeed. Methinks thy voice is altered, and thou speak'st in better phrase and matter than thou didst. You are much deceived. In nothing am I changed but in my garments. Methinks you are better spoken. Come on, sir. Here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy tis to cast one's eyes so low. The crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire. Dreadful trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice, and yon tall anchoring bark diminished to her cock, her cock a boy almost too small for sight, the murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebble chafes cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more, lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon would I not leap upright. Let go my hand. Here, friends, another purse. In it a jewel, well worth a poor man's taking. Fairies and gods prosper it with thee. Go thou further off, bid me farewell, and let me hear thee going. Now, fare ye well, good sir. With all my heart. Why I do trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. Kneeling. O oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce, and in your sights shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer, and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my snuff and loathed part of nature should burn itself out. If Edgar live, O oh, bless him. Now, fellow, fare thee well. Gone, sir. Farewell. Gloucester throws himself forward. And yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought, by this had thought been passed, alive or dead. Ho, oh, you, sir! Friend! Hear you, sir! Speak! Thus might he pass indeed. Yet he revives. What are you, sir? Away, and let me die. Hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou'dst shiver like an egg. But thou dost breathe, hast heavy substance, bleeds not, speaks, art sound. Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Thy life is a miracle. Speak yet again. But have I fallen, or no? From the dread summit of this chalky bourne, look up a height. The shrill, gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard, but do but look up. Alack, I have no eyes. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? T'was yet some comfort when misery could beguile the tyrant's rage and frustrate his proud will. Give me your arm. Yep, so, 
Harist, fill you your legs? You stand? Too well, too well. This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that which parted from you? A poor, unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, methought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses. Horns welked and waved like the enriched sea. It was some fiend. Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honours of men's impossibility have preserved thee. I do remember now. Henceforth, I'll bear affliction till it do cry out itself, Enough, enough, and die. That thing you speak of, I took it for a man. Often t'would say, The fiend, the fiend. He led me to that place. Bear free and patient thoughts. But who comes here? Enter Lear, fantastically dressed with wild flowers. The safer sense will ne'er accommodate his master thus. No, they cannot touch me for coining. I am the king himself. Oh, thou side piercing sight! Nature's above art in that respect. There's your press money. That fellow handles his bow like a crow-keeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace. This piece of toasted cheese will do it. There's my gauntlet. I'll prove it on a giant. Bring up the brown bills. Oh, well-flown bird, i the clout, i the clout, you. Give the word. Sweet Marjoram. Pass. I know that voice. He falls to his knees. Ha! Huh? Goneril with a white beard. They flattered me like a dog, and told me I had white hairs in my beard there, the black ones were there, to say aye and no to everything I said. Aye and no, too, was no good divinity. When the rain came to wet me once, and the wind to make me chatter, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found them, there I smelt them out. Go to, they are not men of their words. They told me I was everything. Tis a lie. I'm not ague-proof. The trick of that voice I do well remember. Is not the king? I, every inch a king. When I do stare, see how the subject quakes. I pardon that man's life. What was thy cause? Adultery. Thou shalt not die. Die for adultery, no. The wren goes to it, and the small gilded fly does lecher in my sight. Let copulation thrive. For Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughter's got between the lawful sheets. To it, luxury, pell-mell, for I lack soldiers. Behold yon simpering dame, whose face between her forks presages snow. That minces virtue, and does shake the head to hear of pleasure's name. The fitchew nor the soiled horse goes to it with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist they are centaurs, though women all above. But to the girdle do the gods inherit. Beneath is all the fiends. There's hell, there's darkness, there is the sulphurous pit, burning, scalding, stench, consumption, of high, fi, fi, pa, va. Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary, to sweeten my imagination. There's money for thee. He gives flowers. Oh, let me kiss that hand. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. O ruined piece of nature, this great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough. Dost thou squinny at me? No, do thy worst, blind Cupid, while not love. Read thou this challenge, mark but the penning of it. Were all the letters sons, I could not see one. I would not take this from report, it is, and my heart breaks at it. Read? What, with the case of eyes? Oh, ho, oh, are you there with me? No eyes in your head, nor no money in your purse? Your eyes are in a heavy case, your purse in a light. Yet you see how this world goes. I see it feelingly. What, art mad? A man may see how the world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. Hark! 
in thine ear, change places, and handy-dandy, which is the justice, which is the thief? Thou hast seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar. Aye, sir. And the creature run from the cur. There thou mightst behold the great image of authority. A dog's obeyed in office. Thou rascal beadle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strike thine own back. Thou hotly lusted to use her in that kind for which thou whipped her. The usurer hangs the cousiner. Through tattered clothes small vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Plate sin with gold, and the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Arm it in rags, a pygmy's straw does pierce it. None doth offend. None, I say none, I label them. Giving flowers. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes, and like a scurvy politician seem to see the things thou dost not. Now, 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 now. Pull off my boots. Harder, harder, so. O oh, matter and impertinency mixed, reason in madness. If thou wilt weep my fortunes, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou must be patient. We came crying hither, thou knowst. The first time we smelt the air, we wall and cry. I will preach to thee, Mark. He takes off his coronet of flowers. Alack, alack the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. This a good block. It were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. I'll put in proof, and when I have stolen upon these sons-in-law, then kill, 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 kill. He throws down his flowers and stamps on them. Enter a gentleman and two attendants. Gloucester and Edgar draw back. Oh, here he is. Lay hand upon him. Sir, your most dear daughter. No rescue. What, a prisoner? I am even the natural fool of fortune. Use me well, you shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons. I am cut to the brains. You shall have anything. No seconds. All myself. Why, this would make a man of salt to use his eyes for garden water-pots. Ay, and for laying autumn's dust. I will die bravely, like a smug bridegroom. What? I will be jovial. Come, come, I am a king, my masters. Know you that? You are a royal one, and we obey you. Then there's life in't. Nay, and you get it, you shall get it by running. Sa, sa, ta, sa. Exit running, followed by attendants. A sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch, past speaking of in a king. Thou hast one daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Hail, gentle sir. Sir, speed you. What's your will? Do you hear aught, sir, of a battle toward? Most sure and vulgar. Every one hears that which can distinguish sound. But by your favour, how near is the other army? Near and on speedy foot. The main descry stands on the hourly thought. I thank you, sir, that's all. Though that the queen on special cause is here, her army is moved on. I thank you, sir. Exit, gentlemen. You ever gentle gods, take my breath from me. Let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. Well, pray you, father. Now, good sir, what are you? A most poor man made tame to fortune's blows, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows am pregnant to good pity. Give me your hand, I'll lead you to some biding. Hearty thanks, the bounty and the benison of heaven to boot and boot. Enter Oswald. A proclaimed prize, most happy. That eyeless head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes. Thou old unhappy traitor, briefly thyself remember. The sword is out that must destroy thee. Now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to it. Edgar intervenes. Wherefore, bold peasant, dost thou support a published traitor? 
hence lest that the infection of his fortune take like hold on thee let go his arm shall not let go sir without further occasion let go slave or thou diest good gentlemen go your gate and let poor vote pass and should have been swaggered out of my life twould not have been so long as tis by a fortnight nay come not near the old man keep out to worry your eyes try whether you're cast out of my bat be the harder shall be plain with you out dunghill shall pick your teeth sir come no matter for your vines they fight slave thou hast slain me villain take my purse if ever thou wilt thrive bury my body and give the letters which thou findst about me to edmund earl of gloucester seek him out upon the british party oh untimely death i know thee well a serviceable villain as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire what is he dead sit you down father rest you let's see these pockets the letters that he speaks of may be my friends he's dead i'm only sorry he had no other death's man let us see leave gentle wax and manners blame us not to know our enemies minds we'd rip their hearts their papers is more lawful he reads the letter let our reciprocal vows be remembered you have many opportunities to cut him off if your will want not time and place will be fruitfully offered there is nothing done if he return the conqueror then am i the prisoner and his bed my jail from the loathed warmth whereof deliver me and supply the place for your labour your wife so i would say affectionate servant goneril oh indistinguished space of woman's will a plot upon her virtuous husband's life in the exchange my brother here in the sands thee i'll rake up the post unsanctified of murderous lechers and in the mature time with this ungracious paper strike the sight of the death-practised duke for him tis well that of thy death and business i can tell the king is mad how stiff is my vile sense that i stand up and have ingenious feeling of my huge sorrows better i were distract so should my thoughts be severed from my griefs, and woes, by wrong imaginations, lose the knowledge of themselves. Give me your hand. Far off, methinks, I hear the beaten drum. Come, father, I'll bestow you with a friend. Exeunt. Scene 7. A tent in the French camp. Lear on a bed, asleep, soft music playing. Enter Cordelia and Kent, physician, gentleman, and others attending. O oh, thou good Kent, how shall I live and work to match thy goodness? My life will be too short, and every measure will fail me. To be acknowledged, madam, is o'er paid. All my reports go with the modest truth nor more nor clipped but so be better suited these weeds are memories of those worser hours i prithee put them off pardon dear madam yet to be known shortens my maid intent my boon i make it that you know me not till time and i think meet then be it so my good lord to the physician how does the king? Madam, sleep still. Cure this great breach in his abused nature. The untuned and jarring senses, O oh, wind-up of this child-changed father. So please, your majesty, that we may wake the king, he hath slept long. Be governed by your knowledge, and proceed in the sway of your own will. Is he arrayed? Aye, madam. In the heaviness of sleep we put fresh garments on him. Be by, good madam, when we do awake him, I doubt not of his temperance. Very well. Music sounds off stage. Please you draw near, louder the music there. Kneeling by the chair and kissing his hand. O oh, my dear father, 
Restoration hang thy medicine on my lips, And let this kiss repair those violent harms That my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Kind and dear princess. Had you not been their father, These white flakes had challenged pity of them. Was this a face to be opposed against the warring winds, To stand against the deep dread-bolted thunder? In the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick cross lightning, to watch, poor Padu, with this thin helm, mine enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should have stood that night against my fire. And wast thou fain, poor father, to hovel thee with swine and rogues forlorn, in short and musty straw? Alack, alack! "'Tis wonder that thy life and wits at once had not concluded all. "'He wakes. Speak to him. "'Madam, do you. Tis fittest. "'How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty?' "'You do me wrong to take me out the grave. "'Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire "'that mine own tears do scald like molten lead.' "'Sir, do you know me?' "'You are a spirit, I know. "'When did you die?' "'Still, still, far wide.' "'He's scarce awake. Let him alone a while.' "'Where have I been? Where am I? "'Fair daylight, I am mightily abused. "'I should e'en die with pity to see another thus. "'I know not what to say. "'I will not swear these are my hands.' Let's see, I, I feel this pinprick. Would I were assured of my condition? Oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hands in benediction o'er me. Lear falls to his knees. No, sir, you must not kneel. Pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man. Four score and upward. Not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. And methinks I should know you, and know this man. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is. And all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for... As I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And so I am. I am. Be your tears wet? Yes. Faith, I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause, they have not. No cause. No cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage, you see, is killed in him, and yet it is danger to make him even o'er the time he has lost. Desire him to go in, trouble him no more till further settling. Will't please your highness walk? You must bear with me. Pray you now, forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Exeunt all but Kent and gentlemen. Holds it true, sir, that the Duke of Cornwall was so slain? Most certain, sir. Who is conductor of his people? As tis said the bastard son of Gloucester. They say Edgar, his banished son, is with the Earl of Kent in Germany. Report is changeable. Tis time to look about. The powers of the kingdom approach. A pace. The arbitrament is like to be bloody. Fare you well, sir. Exit. My point and period will be thoroughly wrought, or well or ill, as this day's battles fought. Exit. End of Act Four. Act Five of King Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Lear by William Shakespeare Act Five. Scene One The Camp of the British Forces near Dover. Enter with drum and colours Edmund, Regan, officers, soldiers, and others. To an officer, Know of the Duke if his last purpose hold, or whether since he is advised by aught to change the course. To Regan, He's full of alteration and self-reproving. To an officer, Bring his constant pleasure. Exit, officer. Our sister's man is certainly miscarried. "'Tis to be doubted, madam. "'Now, sweet lord, you know the goodness I intend upon you. "'Tell me, but truly, but then speak the truth. "'Do you not love my sister?' "'In honoured love. "'But have you never found my brother's way to be the forfended place?' "'That thought abuses you. "'I am doubtful that you have been conjunct and bosomed with her, "'as far as we call us. "'No, by mine honour, madam.' I never shall endure, dear my lord, be not familiar with her. Fear me not, she and the duke her husband. Enter with drum and colours, Albany, Goneril, and soldiers. I had rather lose the battle than that sister should loosen him and me. Our very loving sister, well be met. Sir, this I heard, the king is come to his daughter, with others whom the rigour of our state forced to cry out. Where I could not be honest, I never yet was valiant. For this business it toucheth us, as France invades our land, not bolts the king with others whom, I fear, most just and heavy causes make oppose. Sir, you speak nobly. Why is this reasoned? Combine together against the enemy. For these domestic and particular broils are not the question here. Let's, then, determine with the ancient of war on our proceeding. I shall attend you presently at your tent. Sister, you'll go with us? No. Tis most convenient. Pray you, go with us. Oh, oh, I know the riddle. I will go. Exeunt both the armies. As Albany is going out, enter Edgar. If e'er your grace had speech with man so poor... Hear me one word. To his captains. I'll overtake you. To Edgar. Speak. Before you fight the battle, ope this letter. If you have victory, let the trumpet sound for him that brought it. Wretched though I seem, I can produce a champion that will prove what is avouched there. If you miscarry, your business of the world hath so an end, and machination ceases. Fortune love you. Stay till I have read the letter. I was forbid it. When time shall serve, let but the herald cry, and I'll appear again. Exit. Why, fare thee well. I will o'erlook thy paper. Enter Edmund. The enemy's in view. Draw up your powers. Here is the guess of their true strength and forces by diligent discovery. But your haste is now urged on you. We will greet the time. Exit. To both these sisters have I sworn my love, Each jealous of the other, As the stung are of the adder. Which of them shall I take? Both? Hmm. One? Or neither? Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. To take the widow... Exasperates, makes matter sister Goneril, And hardly shall I carry out my side Her husband being alive. Now then, we'll use his countenance for the battle, Which, being done, let her who would be rid of him Devise his speedy taking off. As for the mercy which he intends to Lear and to Cordelia, The battle done, and they within our power Shall never see his pardon. For my state stands on me to defend, not to debate. Exit. Scene two. 
a field between the two camps. Alarum within. Enter, with drum and colours, Lear, Cordelia holding his hand, and soldiers, over the stage, and exeunt. Enter Edgar and Gloucester. Here, father, take the shadow of this tree for your good host. Pray that the right may thrive. If ever I return to you again, I'll bring you comfort. Grace go with you, sir. Exit Edgar. Alarum and retreat within. Enter Edgar. Away, old man, give me thy hand away. King Lear hath lost, he and his daughter ten. Give me thy hand, come on. No further, sir. A man may rot even here. What, in ill thoughts again? Men must endure their going hence, even as their coming hither. Ripeness is all. Come on! And that's true, too. Exeunt. Scene 3. The British Camp near Dover. Enter in conquest with drum and colours, Edmund. Lear and Cordelia as prisoners, officers, soldiers, etc. Some officers take them away. Good guard until their greater pleasures first be known that are to censor them. We are not the first who with best meaning have incurred the worst. For thee, oppressed king, I am cast down. Myself could else outfrown false fortune's frown. To Edmund. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No, 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 no. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds i' the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies, and hear poor rogues talk of court news, and we'll talk with them too, who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out, and take upon the mystery of things as if we were God's spies, and we'll wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Take them away. Upon such sacrifices, my Cordelia, the gods themselves throw incense. Have I caught thee? He embraces her. He that parts us shall bring a brand from heaven, and fire us hence like foxes. Wipe thine eyes, the good years shall devour them, flesh and fell. Ere they shall make us weep, we'll see em starve first. Come. Exeunt Lear and Cordelia, guarded. Come hither, Captain. Hark. Take thou this note. Go follow them to prison. One step I have advanced thee. If thou dost, as this instructs thee, thou dost make thy way to noble fortunes. Know thou this, that men are as the time is. To be tender-minded does not become a sword. Thy great employment will not bear question. Either say thou doot, or thrive by other means. I'll do it, my lord. About it, and write happy when thou hast done. Mark, I say instantly, and carry it so, as I have set it down. I cannot draw a cart, nor eat dried oats. If it be man's work, I'll do it. Exit. Flourish. Enter Albany, Goneril, Regan, and officers. Sir, you have showed to-day your valiant strain, and fortune led you well. You have the captives who were the opposites of this day's strife. We do require them of you, so to use them as we shall find their merits, and our safety may equally determine. Sir, I thought it fit to send the old and miserable king to some retention and appointed guard, whose age has charms in it with title more, to pluck the common bosom on his side, and turn our impressed lances in our eyes which do command them. With him I sent the queen, my reason all the same, and they are ready to-morrow, or at further space, to appear where you shall hold your session. At this time we sweat and bleed. The friend hath lost his friend, and the best quarrels in the heat are cursed by those that feel their sharpness. The question of Cordelia 
and her father requires a fitter place. Sir, by your patience, I hold you but a subject of this war, not as a brother. That's as we list to grace him. Methinks our pleasure might have been demanded, ere you had spoke so far. He led our powers, bore the commission of my place and person, the which immediacy may well stand up and call itself your brother. Not so hot. In his own grace he doth exalt himself more than in your addition. In my rights, by me invested, he compares the best. Well, that were the most, if he should husband you. Jesters do oft prove prophets. Holla, holla, that eye that told you so looked but a squint. Lady, I am not well, else I should answer from a full-flowing stomach. To Edmund. General, take thou my soldiers, prisoners, patrimony. Dispose of them, of me. The walls are thine, witness the world, that I create thee here, my lord and master. Mean you to enjoy him? The let alone lies not in your good will. Nor in thine, lord. Half-blooded fellow, yes. To Edmund. Let the drums strike and prove my title thine. Stay yet, hear reason. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason, and in thine arrest, this gilded serpent. He points to Goneril. For your claim, fair sister, I bar it in the interest of my wife. "'Tis she is subcontracted to this lord, "'and I, her husband, contradict your bans. "'If you will marry, make your loves to me. "'My lady is bespoke. "'An interlude. "'Thou art armed, Gloucester. "'Let the trumpet sound. "'If none appear to prove upon thy person "'thy heinous, manifest, and many treasons, "'there is my pledge. "'He throws down his glove. "'I'll prove it on thy heart, ere I taste bread, Thou art in nothing less than I have here proclaimed thee. Sick, oh, sick. If not, I'll ne'er trust medicine. There's my exchange. Throwing down his glove. What in the world he is that names me traitor? Villain-like he lies. Call by thy trumpet. He that dares approach on him, on you, who not? I will maintain my truth and honour firmly. A herald, ho! Enter a herald. Trust to thy single virtue, for thy soldiers, all levied in my name, have in my name took their discharge. My sickness grows upon me. She is not well. Convey her to my tent. Exit Regan, supported. A herald! Ho! A herald! A trumpet sounds. If any man of quality or degree within the lists of the army will maintain upon Edmund supposed Earl of Gloucester, that he is a manifold traitor, let him appear by the third sound of the trumpet. He is bold in his defence. First trumpet. Again. Second trumpet. Again. Third trumpet. Trumpet answers within. Enter Edgar, armed, a trumpet before him. Ask him his purposes. Why he appears upon this call the trumpet. What are you? Your name, your quality, and why you answer this present summons? No, my name is lost. By treason's tooth bare, gnawn and canker bit. Yet am I noble as the adversary I come to cope. Which is that adversary? What's he that speaks for Edmund, Earl of Gloucester? Himself. What sayest thou to him? Draw thy sword, that if my speech offend a noble heart, thy arm may do thee justice. Here is mine. He draws his sword. Behold, it is the privilege of mine honours, my oath and my profession. I protest, maugre thy strength, youth, place, and eminence. Despite thy victor sword and fire new fortune, thy valour and thy heart, thou art a traitor. False to thy gods, thy brother, and thy father. Conspirant against this high, illustrious prince, and from the extremest upward of thy head to the descent and dust beneath thy foot, a most toad-spotted traitor. Say thou no, 
this sword, this arm, and my best spirits are bent to prove upon my heart whereto I speak, thou liest. In wisdom I should ask thy name, but since thy outside looks so fair and warlike, and that thy tongue some say of breeding breathes, what safe and nicely I might well delay by rule of knighthood, I disdain and spurn. Back do I toss those treasons to thy head, with the hell-hated lie o'erwhelm thy heart, which, for they yet glance by and scarcely bruise, this sword of mine shall give them instant way, where they shall rest for ever. Trumpets, speak! Alarums, fights, Edmund falls. To Edgar, about to kill Edmund. Save him! Save him! This is mere practice, Gloucester. By the law of arms thou wast not bound to answer an unknown opposite. Thou art not vanquished, but cozened and beguiled. Shut your mouth, dame, or with this paper I shall stop it. Hold, sir. To Goneril. Thou, worse than any name, read thine own evil. No tearing, lady, I perceive you know it. Say if I do. The laws are mine, not thine. Who can arraign me for it? Most monstrous. Know'st thou this paper? Ask me not what I know. Exit Goneril. Go after her, she's desperate. Govern her. Exit officer. What you have charged me with that have I done, and more, much more. The time will bring it out. Tis past, and so am I. But what art thou that hast this fortune on me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. Let's exchange charity. I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou hast wronged me. My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where thee he got cost him his eyes. Thou hast spoken right, tis true. The wheel is come full circle. I am here. Methought thy very gate did prophesy a royal nobleness. I must embrace thee. Let sorrow split my heart if ever I did hate thee or thy father. Worthy prince, I note. Where have you hid yourself? How have you known the miseries of your father? By nursing them, my lord. List a brief tale. And when tis told, oh, that my heart would burst. The bloody proclamation to escape that followed me so near. Oh, our life's sweetness! That with the pain of death we'd hourly die rather than die at once, taught me to shift into a madman's rags, to assume a semblance that very dogs disdained, and in this habit met I my father with his bleeding rings. Their precious stones new lost, became his guide, led him, begged for him, saved him from despair. Never, O oh, fault, revealed myself unto him until some half hour passed when I was armed. Not sure, though hoping of this good success. I asked his blessing, and from first to last told him my pilgrimage. But his flawed heart, alack, too weak the conflict to support, to ex two extremes of passion, joy and grief, burst smilingly. This speech of yours hath moved me, and shall perchance do good. But speak you on. You look as you had something more to say. If there be more, more woeful, hold it in, for I am almost ready to dissolve hearing of this. This would have seemed a period to such as love, not sorrow, but another, to amplify too much, would make much more, and top extremity. Whilst I was big in clamour, came there a man who, having seen me in my worst estate, shunned my abhorred society. But then... Finding who twas that so endured with his strong arms, he fastened on my neck, and bellowed out as he'd burst heaven, threw him on my father, told the most piteous tale of Lear and him that ever ear received, which in recounting his grief grew puissant, and the strings of life began to crack. Twice then the trumpet sounded, and there I left him tranced. But who was this? Kent, sir. The banished Kent, who in disguise followed his enemy king and did him service improper for a slave. Enter a gentleman with a bloody knife. Help! 
Help, oh help! What kind of help? Speak, man. What means that bloody knife? Tis hot, it smokes. It came even from the heart of... Oh, she's dead. Who dead? Speak, man. Your lady, sir, your lady. And her sister by her is poisoned. She hath confessed it. I was contracted to them both. All three now marry in an instant. Here comes Kent. Enter Kent. Produce their bodies, be they alive or dead. This judgment of the heaven that makes us tremble touches us not with pity. Exit, gentlemen. I am come to bid my king and master I good night. Is he not here? Great thing of us forgot. Speak, Edmund, where's the king? And where's Cordelia? Goneril's and Regan's bodies are brought out. Alack! Why thus? Yet Edmund was beloved. The one the other poisoned for my sake, and after slew herself. Even so, cover their faces. I pant for life. Some good I mean to do. Despite of mine own nature, quickly send, be brief in it, to the castle. For my writ is on the life of Lear, and on Cordelia. Nay, send in time. Run, run, oh run! To who, my lord? Who has the office? Send thy token of reprieve. Well thought on. To an officer. Take my sword, give it to the captain. Haste thee for thy life. Exit officer. He hath commissioned from thy wife and me to hang Cordelia in the prison, and to lay the blame upon her own despair that she fordid herself. The gods defend her. Bear him hence a while. Edmund is borne off. Enter Lear with Cordelia in his arms, followed by the officer and others. Howl, 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 howl! Oh, you are men of stone! Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone for ever. I know when one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth. Lend me a looking-glass. If that her breath will mist or stain the stone, why, then she lives. Is this the promised end? Or image of that horror? Fall and cease. This feather stirs, she lives. If it be so, it is a chance which does redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. Oh, my good master. Prithee away. Tis noble Kent, your friend. A plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her. Now she's gone for ever. Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little. Ah, what is thou sayest? Her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low, an excellent thing in woman. I killed the slave that was a-hanging thee. Did I not, fellow? I have seen the day with my good biting falchion that I would have made them skip. I am old now, and these same crosses spoil me. Who are you? Mine eyes are not the best. I'll tell you straight. If fortune brag of two she loved and hated— one of them we behold. This is a dull sight. Are you not Kent? The same. Your servant Kent. Where is your servant Caius? He's a good fellow, I can tell you that. He'll strike, and quickly too. He's dead and rotten. No, my good lord. I am the very man. I'll see that straight that from your first of difference and decay have followed your sad steps. You are welcome hither. Nor no man else. All's cheerless, dark and deadly. Your eldest daughters have fordone themselves, and desperately are dead. Aye, so I think. He knows not what he says. And vain is it that we present us to him. Very bootless. Enter a messenger. Edmund is dead, my lord. That's but a trifle here. You lords and noble friends know our intent. What comfort to this great decay may come shall be applied. For us we will resign during the life of this old majesty. To him our absolute power. To Edgar and Kent. To you your rights. 
with boot and such addition as your honours, have more than merited. All friends shall taste the wages of their virtue, and all foes the cup of their deservings. Oh, see, see! And my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? Thou come no more, never, 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 never. Pray you undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her, look, her lips. Look there, look there. He dies. He faints, my lord, my lord. Break, heart. I prithee break. Look up, my lord. Vex not his ghost. Oh, let him pass. He hates him that would upon the wreck of this rough world stretch him out longer. He is gone indeed. The wonder is he hath endured so long. He but usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. To Kent and Edgar. Friends of my soul, you twain rule this realm, and the gored state sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. The weight of this sad, sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest have borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. Exeunt with a dead march. End of King Lear by William Shakespeare Your cast have been Andy Minter as Lear, King of Britain. Eswa as the King of France, Justin Barrett as the Duke of Burgundy, the Messenger and the Captain, Corrie Samuel as the Duke of Cornwall, Christine Le Moyne as the Duke of Albany, Denis Sayers as the Earl of Kent, Julian Jameson as the Earl of Gloucester, Simon Taylor as Edgar, John Gonzalez as Edmund, Karen Savage as Corran, Carl Manchester as the old man, Scott Walter as the physician, Sean McGahey as the fool, Andrew Lebrun as Oswald, Henry Fregon as the officer, Cara Schallenberg as the gentleman, Gazina as the herald, Ophelia Darcy as the first servant, Esther as the second servant, Kirsten Ferreri as the third servant and the knight, Laura Barnes as a messenger. Goneril was played by Rosalind Wills, Regan by Gemma Blythe, and Cordelia by Christine Hughes. Stage directions and production by David Barnes.